Second principle of good decision making is that we want to reality test our assumptions. The villain here is what psychologists have called the confirmation bias. Now you may have seen in the group decision making exercise that there was a tendency for your group to, to lean towards Brickman and Bing for the marketing decision. And that discussion typically starts out, there's good reasons to favor them, and so everybody piles on with more good reasons to favor them, and reasons not to favor Fournier partners. That's the confirmation bias in action. And what the confirmation bias says in general is that our mental spotlight is really good at focusing on stuff that supports my current leaning, my current inclination, my current belief. What's a little harder is to get that mental spotlight to, to come over and focus on the stuff that doesn't support my current belief. Now you may have noticed this if you've ever had an argument with your significant other. There are very few times that somebody pauses in the middle of an argument and says, you know, honey, the most marvelous argument in favor of your position just occurred to me. Now, how do we overcome confirmation bias? Well, that's a tricky situation because in all the research that's been done, in dozens of studies, there's a strong tendency to collect that information that supports our belief. So imagine that you're a Thai food fan and a new Thai food restaurant comes to town and you log on to Yelp and there are four star reviews and two star reviews. How many of each do you sample? Well, this research has been done with lots of different choices and lots of different contexts. And the answer overall is 2x. You're twice as likely to favor the information that supports your current belief as the information that doesn't. And this is pretty subtle because people are people are unaware that they're doing it. They think they're being even-handed because they're looking at all the information. They're just looking at the information that supports their case about twice as often as they look at the information that doesn't. And for a Thai food restaurant, maybe that's unimportant, but the same results happened in the 1950s when we didn't know as much as we know now about smoking and lung cancer. And if you give smokers two headlines, one says that smoking causes lung cancer, and one says that smoking found uncorrelated with lung cancer. Which one do you think the smokers pick up? Well, they pick up the article and read the article that supports their current belief. The best defense against confirmation bias is to reality test our assumptions. What does that look like? Well, if you log on to the web, you're thinking about going to Myrtle Beach, you might see pictures of the Polynesian Resort. And the Polynesian Resort looks like a wonderful place, according to their website. What they don't mention on their website that you would have to log over to TripAdvisor to find out is that the Polynesian Resort was one of 2009's dirtiest hotels, according to TripAdvisor. In fact, it was number five on the list. And you start logging in, reading the reviews of this, and the reviews are scathing and hilarious. One person said, my dog was at a kennel, and his accommodations were cleaner and more plush than the Polynesian. Another one said, I went to the store and bought a can of bed bug and flea spray and still thought about sleeping in my car. This is my favorite. Many reviews compared this property to a dump. That just isn't fair to the dumps of the world. The vast majority of reviews of the Polynesian Resort are completely negative. Now, it wouldn't ever occur to us to shop for a camera, to shop for a vacation place, without trusting the averages, trusting the feedback that we get online. But while that's intuitive for shopping, it's not intuitive for other areas of life. Now, what this says is that in terms of evaluating our own lives, we should trust the averages over our own view of a specific case. Because our view of the specific case is influenced by that confirmation bias, but the averages aren't. The averages aren't corrupted by that. So if we're trying to predict how long it will take to complete a task at work, the confirmation bias view of the world is to think positively about completing that task. I think, well, I'll, I'll do this and then that and then that, and I should have that task done by the end of the week. But the trust the averages view of the world says, of my last five projects like this, how quickly did I get them done? And if I find out the answer to that question is more like two and a half weeks than a week, I better trust the averages because my view of the case is going to be heavily influenced by the confirmation bias. Phil Tetlock is a researcher and went out and studied experts making predictions in their domain of expertise. He studied over 82,000 predictions. These are economists predicting the economic futures of uh, a particular country or a particular region. They're political experts predicting the election cycles uh, in the countries that they are experts on. 82,000 predictions. And here's what didn't matter. 
Education didn't matter. PhDs were no more successful at this task than people without a PhD. Experience didn't matter. People with 20 years of experience weren't any better at predicting than people that were new. Media attention turned out to matter. It mattered in a, a counterintuitive way. People that were on television, people that you see in the media making predictions, were actually among the worst predictors. So if you're watching somebody on a cable news show, you can know in the back of your mind, they're probably wrong. What's amazing about his studies is there was something that worked, and it wasn't experts, it wasn't PhDs, it wasn't experienced people, it wasn't media pundits. It was the averages. Experts performed worse than the averages, even very crude averages. So if you're trying to predict next year's imports for a country, you're gonna be better off taking the average of the last three years and ignoring whether the global economy is in recession, ignoring the fact that there may be uh, political unrest in a particular area. There are all kinds of things that experts could have been taking into account that the average doesn't take into account, and yet the average is outperforming the experts. And I think that should be a cautionary note to us in our predictions because even the best experts in their domain of expertise have a hard time beating the averages. And I think with humility, we might want to respect those averages too. Now, we've been talking about reality, the reality part of reality testing. And the, the, the assumption here is that we need to get the real data. But there's another, there's another problem. Suppose that there's no data. Somebody says, I want to be a pharmacist. And even though you can look up job satisfaction of lawyers, it's harder to look up job satisfaction of pharmacists. Suppose there's a nonprofit that's thinking about, I think about forming a partnership with this other nonprofit. Well, there's no database that you can consult of future partners for nonprofits. In that case, what I want to emphasize is, that, is the testing part of reality testing, that we can go out and test our assumptions. One of my favorite firms that you've probably never heard of is National Instruments. They're the kind of Apple computer of measuring devices. They make hardware and software that work really well together. But they're constantly having to make decisions about which hardware to support, how to extend their, their software platform. If you heard about the, the discovery of the God particle, the super collider in Europe that discovered that, that was run on National Instruments software. There were thousands of physicists and, and engineers that were working together, and they were cobbling together a measuring device to measure something that had never been seen or discovered before with National Instruments software. But the same software is easy enough to use that you can put a version of it in a, a Lego kit, uh, a $300 Lego kit, but your 10-year-old can go out and build a robot and learn to program it on the same software that they're gonna be using later on as a mechanical or electrical engineer uh, discovering the God particle. Now, what National Instruments says about making decision after decision after decision about technology is they've got a phrase, they say, ooch, before you leap. And I love that word, ooch. It's a little experiment. It's a little, it's a little hint in a particular direction. In, in sailing, they talk about when, you're, when your boat gets uh, left without wind, sometimes you can turn the boat around by ooching it, by forcing your body a little bit. And what National Instruments says is that before we take a big leap, before we make a big decision in an area, we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to try a little bit of the technology. Now, this intuition would be useful in lots of situations. So the nonprofit that's thinking about the partnership, before you leap into that partnership, can you ooch your way in? What if you tackle two projects together? See how you interact with the people at the other nonprofit. See if your goals really are aligned up. Let's think for a moment about the interview process because it's, a, it's an ooching absence field. And if we think about the typical interview, imagine you're a coach and you're recruiting somebody for the Olympic relay team. What you would probably do is bring in that person to the track, have them run a few laps, have them do some baton passes with the rest of the team. What you wouldn't do is go to TGI Fridays, have a beer, stare into the athlete's eyes and try to establish whether they have the, the, the energy and the drive and the skills of an Olympic caliber athlete. And yet, sadly enough, if we think about our interview process in organizations, it looks a lot more like the TGI Friday situation than the running around the track situation. And in all the research that's been done on this, it turns out that interviews are less predictive than uches. Interviews are less predictive than work samples. So if your nonprofit is trying to hire a new vice president of marketing, rather than interviewing them, why not tease off part of the new marketing plan? Hire them for a consulting assignment. 
and give them three or four weeks worth of work. And at the end of that consulting assignment, you're going to know a lot more about them. You're going to know how they think about marketing. You're going to know whether they get the organization. You're going to see how they interact with the people that are involved. Now, we can't always do an ooch. We can't always do an experiment. But it turns out that anything that gets us closer to testing reality is going to be an improvement on the standard interview. So research has also shown that even case studies are more successful at selecting good candidates. So chief financial officer you're hiring, you may not be able to tease off a part of the task and assign it to, as a consulting assignment, but give the CFO candidate a set of case studies of the seven trickiest decisions that your organization has made over the last three or four years. See how they think about it. See how they analyze the situation. See what alternatives they think about. You're going to be in a better position to understand what reality is. Scott Cook runs the firm into it. They make TurboTax. They make uh, QuickBooks software. He says there are three P's of business decision making, and none of them are particularly good ways of making decisions. He said most business decisions are made by politics, persuasion, and PowerPoint. And what he says is that, look, we're trying to create in our company a culture of experimentation. Why are we predicting something when we can actually know? I'll leave you with one entrepreneur that might have done better by reality testing his assumptions. This is a plumber in Nova Scotia. And, and I think what he was trying to do was to, to draw people's attention to the trucks that they would drive around as they were fixing people's plumbing. And he wanted to have something that would catch people's attention and make them want to call him up when they had their plumbing problems. And unfortunately, I think the thing that he came up with was not necessarily going to work for him. It, it looked like that. And if we zoom in a little bit, you know, this is a situation that desperately cries out for a focus group, for a little bit of testing. I think we would have found that, Harvey, you know, it really is eye-catching, but I'm not sure it's going to make people want to invite you into their home. The implication for all of us is if we want to make better decisions, we need to reality test our assumptions.